Hello, my name is Matt Ferris. I am a public health inspector with Peterborough Public Health. And today I'm here to talk about preventing the spread of COVID-19 in an essential service office workplace. If you do have any questions at the end of this presentation, please feel free to send me an email at mferris at peterboroughpublichealth.ca and what I'll do is I'll compile all the questions, um, put them into a document, uh, provide answers, and uh, I'll make sure that everybody's names are kept confidential, um, and I'll send that back to your workplace. So on the agenda for this presentation, uh, we're gonna start by looking at what is COVID-19. Then we're going to start looking at the basics of what we can do to actually prevent the spread how to protect ourselves and others. Uh, then we're going to look a little bit more in depth um, about what we can do to protect ourselves and others. So we're going to start with what is COVID-19? And I think most people know this at this point, um, but it's the name of the disease caused by the 2019 novel coronavirus. And in humans, coronaviruses can cause illness ranging from common cold to much more severe respiratory infections. It's important to keep in mind that roughly 80% of people infected with COVID-19 will experience mild to moderate respiratory symptoms and will not require medical care. This is part of the reason that this is so contagious. People just treat it as if it's a common cold and they continue to go out in public, they continue to go visit people. Um, so people over the age of 70 and also people that have compromised immune systems are at the highest risk for developing more severe illness that can be life-threatening. So the basics, when you zoom out and you look at how is this COVID-19 spread, it's spread via two main ways. One is from person to person via respiratory droplets. And you've probably heard a lot about maintain two meters from everyone, especially people who are symptomatic with respiratory symptoms. The reason for that is that droplets typically don't travel very far. Um, they usually don't go beyond two meters. So that's why everybody's saying stand two meters away from everybody at all times, especially those people that are symptomatic. So that's the biggest thing that we can do is try to maintain that physical distance of two meters. How those respiratory droplets can make you sick is somebody's coughing, sneezing, even talking. And some of those respiratory droplets, if you're within two meters, can get into your mouth, into your nose, into your eyes. So that's thought to be the main way this is spread. Um, what can we do to prevent it? The two meters, maintaining that two meters distance using proper respiratory etiquette. And that just means when you go to cough or sneeze, you do so in a tissue, or if you don't have a tissue, you do so in your elbow, and as always, making sure we do lots of hand washing afterwards. And then there's a brand new recommendation that came out on April 6th, and this is to protect others. It hasn't been shown to protect yourself, but if you wanted to use a cloth mask, a non-medical face mask, in situations where physical distancing would be difficult, you can also do that. So that recommendation just came out. So that's the first way, um, respiratory droplets. The second way, and it's thought to be like a more of a secondary way that this is spread, is through touching somebody that has the virus on them or touching an object that has the virus on it and then introducing it into your body. And the ways that you would do that is from touching your face, specifically touching your nose, your mouth, um, or your eyes. So we have to be really mindful of limiting hand-to-face contact. And just during this time, we have to be hyper-vigilant with hand-washing, lots and lots of hand-washing. Uh, if, if there's no sink around, we can use uh, hand sanitizer gels. Um, we'll talk about those a little bit later on, but those are the two main ways it's spread. It's very easy to start 
freaking yourself out um, if you go online and just search for coronavirus or COVID-19. I did this the other day, uh, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago now, but um, I, I, there's one day where there's a bunch of articles that basically said something along the lines of coronavirus can live in the air for three hours, which started making me feel anxious. Um, it's a very misleading statement, and with any of these things, there's always a grain of truth, um, and so I looked into this. This was based on a study, um, I believe is New England Journal of Medicine, so it's a respected, a respected paper, um, and the study was called Aerosol and Surface Stability of SARS-CoV-2 as compared with SARS-CoV-1. Then when you look at the method that they used in this study, um, what they did is they took liquid containing these virus particles and created an aerosol for essentially a fog using a three-jet collision nebulizer which is fed into this specialized piece of equipment called the Goldberg drum. And the purpose of the Goldberg drum is to keep aerosolized particles suspended in the air so they can actually be studied. So yes, it's based on fact that surviving in the air for three hours, um, it can happen in this experimental situation. Um, but it's not what's likely to happen. It's not how we're seeing the virus being spread. Um, important to remember that this is, does not reflect normal human cough conditions. It's not the way it's normally spread. Public Health Ontario, um, as of April 6th, um, they're saying no evidence that COVID-19 is transmitted through the airborne route. Um, Anything that's aerosolized can travel much, much further than the bigger droplets that normally come out of our mouths when we cough or sneeze or talk. Um, still Public Health Ontario, um, they're recommending droplet and contact precautions for routine care of patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. The one time that they're rec recommending airborne precautions is when there's aerosol generating medical procedures taking place. And what are those? It's intubation, bronchoscopy, things like autopsy of lung tissue. So these are not things you should be doing in an office environment anyways. Uh, these are very specific medical situations. So <clears throat> there's also been some information that's come out recently that's talked about symptomatic versus pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic spread. Um, it's important to keep in mind there is some data coming out that's showing that this can be spread by people who are pre-symptomatic, so they're not showing the most severe symptoms or in some cases maybe any symptoms. That's not the normal way this is being spread. It's only been found in a few different cases. It's thought still, and this is from the WHO, um, that it's primarily transmitted from symptomatic people to others who are in close contact with respiratory droplets from that person, or by direct contact with infected persons, or by contact with contaminated objects and surfaces. So again, it's um, what's possible. It, there is some transmission that's possible pre-symptomatically, but it's not what's likely. We're, most of the cases that we're seeing right now, the science is saying uh, they're coming from contact with people who were symptomatic. So review, just to look at the basics of what we can do here. COVID-19 spread from person to person via respiratory droplets. The best thing you can do is maintain that two meters distance between everybody at all times, especially those people who are symptomatic. Uh, use proper respiratory etiquette. The new recommendation, if you're going to be in a situation where physical distancing is going to be really difficult, you could wear a non-medical face mask, like a cloth mask, um, and that would really prevent the droplets from leaving your mouth and nose and uh, making other people sick, potentially. So it's, it, that precaution is really meant to protect other people. The other way is from touching a contaminated object and then introducing that virus from your hands 
into your body. So maintaining proper hand hygiene is essential. We'll talk about that later. And just being really mindful um, to limit hand-to-face contact. Most people, myself included, my hands go up into my face all the time. I'm usually not aware of it, and then I'm just biting on my fingernail or I'm itching. So we just have to be very mindful of this. So physical distancing, big one, two meters between all people, all times. If you have to be within that two meter range, we want to keep it as brief as possible. Respiratory etiquette, we talked about that briefly. And it's basically cover your cough. Um, use tissue to catch your cough. Um, wash your hands afterwards if there's no tissue around. You just want to be coughing or sneezing into your elbow. Again, washing your hands afterwards. Keep in mind, you should not be around other people if you're experiencing any respiratory symptoms like that. Hand hygiene, we do go into it later. Um, there's two main ways that hand hygiene can be performed. Um, everybody knows soap, running water, very, very effective way to remove things from the hands. Everything from dirt, grime, bacteria, viruses. We'll talk about how to do that. And using hand sanitizer gels and foam can also be a very effective way to prevent the spread of this thing. So now we're going to look a little bit more in depth. Um, so to prevent and control the transmission of microorganisms, we need to focus on the following principles. One, looking at what we're actually doing and performing a risk assessment. Two, and it's boring, but it's just good hand hygiene, very, very effective. Three, we look at the use of personal protective equipment. D, we look at control of the environment. And finally, we look at administrative controls. Those are the five things we're going to be looking at. These are referred to as routine practices. Um, they were mainly developed for the healthcare industry, uh, mainly adopted uh, by healthcare providers. However, um, they can be applied to all workplace settings, and it's to prevent the transmission of infectious material. So again, risk assessment, hand hygiene, use of personal protective equipment if it's required, of course, controlling the environment and having some administrative controls in place. That's the whole system that we use to prevent the spread. So one, with the risk assessment, um, when you hear risk assessment, you start thinking this sounds super complex. It's really not. Um, it's just keeping in mind how this thing is spread. It's spread through the droplet route from person to person and through contact with contaminated objects. Keep in mind, respiratory droplets do not typically travel very far, usually less than two meters before being pulled down to the ground by gravity. Before each staff or client interaction, you need to look at what will you actually be doing is there a risk of exposure to the COVID-19 virus here? Does the client staff member have symptoms of a respiratory infection? What kind of contact will you be having with the client? Is there a way to maintain that two meter distance uh, between you and the client during this interaction? Is there a way to avoid contaminating your hands during the interaction? Next, we're gonna look at hand hygiene. And we kind of take this one for granted. Um, we've, we've been told forever to be washing our hands, and a lot of us kind of just start to roll our eyes when we hear about hand washing is so effective. We have to keep in mind it's a fairly new invention. Um, in the middle of the 1800s, there was a doctor in Vienna named Ignaz Semmelweis who started seeing there's a lot of people dying in the hospital. Uh, he was working in the Vienna General Hospital, he started recommending to some of the doctors to start washing their hands in between doing autopsies and uh, helping women deliver their babies. And he basically lost his job because of it. Um, he was looked at as a, as a dumb idea. The, the theory at the time was that 
all disease just traveled through the air and that's how you got sick. It wasn't until after he died that germ theory was proven. And now we know there's these germs, viruses, bacteria. There are these little tiny physical things. And hand washing is so effective because it just lifts those things off the hands and then you can rinse them away. So hand hygiene, very, very effective. That and physical distancing are the two things you really need to focus on. So when should we be performing hand hygiene? Just think any time before you touch your face, before you're preparing, handling, serving, eating food, after you use the washroom, after any kind of contact with body substances, uh, before putting on and taking off PPE, that's very important. Uh, anytime, if you're going to be using a mask, um, you want to be washing your hands before you put that on and uh, afterwards as well. Before and after any kind of client contact. A big one is after touching regularly touched items such as doorknobs, toilets, sinks. Basically, whenever there's a chance that your hands may have been contaminated during this COVID-19 pandemic, we want to be washing our hands, being hypervigilant with that. So when should we be washing our hands? Um, when our hands are visibly soiled or when they feel sticky. Um, you don't want to be using hand sanitizer gels or foams when your hands are sweaty, sticky. Um, it's not going to work properly. We'll talk about that in a minute. Hand washing, uh, very, very effective and it's needed when your hands are soiled in any way. And we'll just look at this poster. I'm sure most people are familiar with the proper way to wash your hands. It's just uh, most people, myself, uh, most people, myself included, um, when I'm not being mindful of this, I just do the real quick soap on hands, soap under the running water, kind of just trying to get the soap off as quickly as possible to feel like I did something. Um, that's not effective. Um, so during this, we need to make sure we're actually doing effective hand washing. And this is one way to do that. So starting with, you get your hands wet to start. Then you put the liquid soap on your hands. And then you lather away from the running water for at least 20 seconds. And this is what most of us don't do. Most of us put our hands under the running water. Uh, not very effective. So away from the running water and just being very careful to get in between your fingers, uh, the backs of your hands, around your thumbs, the tips of your fingers, trying to push some soap up uh, underneath your fingernails. Um, after 20 seconds, which you can keep track of that time by singing the happy birthday song about two times in your head. Um, a good thorough rinse. And then you want to use paper towel instead of using the same cloth over and over again. You want to use paper towel. Turn the taps off with the paper towel. That's a very, very effective way at removing virus, bacteria, dirt, grime from off of your hands. <clears throat> Hand sanitizers. Um, can be very effective as well. Um, just keep in mind, your hands do need to be clean for those sanitizers to work. If your hands have a bunch of grime all over them, what happens is the sanitizer and the gel ends up trying to kill all that grime and oil, and it just ends up becoming not as effective. It's not sanitizing your hands beneath. Um, so you do need to have fairly clean hands for hand sanitizers to work. Um, Typically, alcohol-based rubs are being recommended. Um, sometimes they're hard to come by. Um, but the minimum alcohol concentration needs to be 60% with these alcohol-based rubs. There are a bunch of alcohol-free hand sanitizers that you can also use. And if you're looking for some of these alcohol-free ones, there is a list uh, at the Health Canada website, which is linked below. I guess I should mention um, with the hand sanitizing, only appropriate when your hands are not dirty and you just want to think about it just like hand washing where you're trying to cover all the surfaces of your hands, the tips of your fingers under your fingernails, backs of your hands and rub it in until it, it's dry, uh, usually about 20 seconds. 
Okay, so for the next one, we're going to look at use of personal protective equipment or PPE. And I'm starting to say this a lot, but just keep it in mind that physical distancing at two meters and proper hand hygiene, those are the most important ways to protect yourself from this virus. Um, improper use of PPE can create a false sense of confidence, um, can increase chance of infection and waste supply. So you really only want to be using PPE when it's needed. Um, and it's going to be based on a risk assessment. You're going to be looking at what are you actually doing. And so just so you know, the only time that a mask, gloves, eye protection, and gown are being recommended are if you're providing direct care for a person that's suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19. So think medical care. Um, or if you must be within two meters of somebody that is symptomatic with respiratory symptoms. So gloves. In an office environment, hand hygiene should be totally sufficient. Um, with gloves, you have to be very careful to perform hand hygiene before you put them on, after you take them off. Um, gloves tend to be uh, used in an improper way a lot. They, they're kept on for too long. People touch their faces with them on. Um, so it is something that you could use. It could be used by cleaning staff, but just hand washing, being vigilant with that and using hand sanitizer gels, uh, that's really all that's going to be needed most of the time in an office environment. So masks. Um, so these, we have to keep in mind that these are really intended to be worn by those who are ill, and it's to protect those around them. Um, wearing a non-medical mask is an additional measure you can take. This just came out uh, April 6th. Uh, Dr. Teresa Tan made the recommendation. Non-medical mask would refer to any, any kind of material over your nose and mouth that would just prevent droplets from you uh, contaminating other people. So when you could do that is where physical distancing would be very, very difficult. Also important to keep in mind with non-medical masks, um, they've not been proven to protect the person wearing them. Um, so still strict hygiene, public health measures like lots of hand washing, distancing are the main things that are going to reduce your chance of being exposed to the virus. So this is directly from the Health Canada website. So if you decide to wear a non-medical mask, um, be very careful to wash your hands immediately before putting it on and immediately after taking it off. Um, if you're not doing that, uh, it, it can actually increase your chance of infection because our hands get contaminated when we're out touching things that other people touch. And then if we're messing around with a mask uh, on our face over and over again, it just gives all these opportunities for whatever's on our hands to get onto our face and potentially into our bodies. So good hand hygiene. It should fit well. Um, there shouldn't be huge gaps in it. Um, and you probably weren't planning on sharing it with others, but don't share it with others. Eye protection, again, in an office environment, eye protection should not be necessary. This is intended to be worn by people providing direct care, think medical professionals, for a person that's suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19. And gowns, again, in an office environment should not be necessary, intended to be worn by people providing direct care in situations where it's anticipated that they will be exposed to spray or splash back while providing that direct care. So that should not be happening in an office environment. Personal protective equipment summary. So physical distancing at two meters and proper hand hygiene. Those are your two go-tos um, based on new recommendations from Health Canada. Um, if you want to, in situations where physical distancing is difficult, you can wear a non-medical mask to protect those around you. 
Next, we're going to look at the control of the environment. Okay, so control of the environment, um, that's control of the office workplace. Um, it's going to start with proper screening of clients, uh, ideally before they enter the building. You don't want to allow anybody into the building that is experiencing any kind of symptoms of illness, and you want to make sure that you're keeping all the surfaces that are regularly touched in your office space regularly cleaned and sanitized. <clears throat> um, Public Health Ontario is recommending that any regularly touched public surfaces are cleaned and sanitized at least twice daily. Um, for a list of effective hard surface sanitizers, you can also go to the Health Canada website uh, at the link below. But it's the normal disinfectants that we normally use are effective. You just have to make sure that you use them um, as, as per the manufacturer's directions. So keeping surfaces clean, sanitized, very important. A big one is that <clears throat> staff must not report to work if, it's, if experiencing respiratory symptoms. We have to keep in mind uh, that roughly 80% of people that get COVID-19, it's going to be fairly mild to moderate symptoms. It's not going to require medical attention. So you, you'll probably feel like you have a mild cold. And we don't want to assume it's just, no, this is not COVID-19. If you're having any kind of respiratory symptoms, you want to be distancing yourself from everybody. Um, so in an office environment, uh, don't show up if you're sick. Um, if you're well and you're in the office, if physical meetings are absolutely necessary, we want to do everything we can to maintain that two meters between staff, clients, Another thing you could do is limit the number of staff working in different areas so that there's two meters between staff at all times when they're at their desks. Uh, try to arrange for different interactions um, that are not in person if possible, either via Skype or webinar, or phone call. Um, if this is not possible, uh, you just want to be keeping in mind that two meters all the time. Um, there's some information at Health Canada. Uh, the link is there. It's a document called Preventing COVID-19 in the Workplace. Uh, it's for employers, employees, and essential service workers. And now we're going to look at some administrative controls. And again, don't come to work if you're experiencing respiratory symptoms. This is in accordance with your workplace policy. Your workplace should have schedules for cleaning and disinfection. And this is any kind of regularly touched surface uh, cleaned and disinfected twice per day during this pandemic. And another recommendation is to post educational material around the office, just even signage about washing your hands, proper respiratory etiquette, proper use of hand sanitizer gels. And it just keeps that information at the top of people's heads. It's, it's in their mind all the time. It makes them be mindful. Um, you can find signage uh, on our website if you're looking for it, peterboroughpublichealth.ca. So conclusion, uh, it really is fairly simple to prevent the spread of this thing, and there's two main ways. Yet It's just important to keep that in mind all the time. It's from person to person via respiratory droplets, from touching a contaminated person or object and then actually introducing that virus into your body by touching your, your nose, your eyes, your mouth. You can find lots of information on our website. Um, there's a specific section, COVID-19 information section. It's on our main page, peterboroughpublichealth.ca. It's being updated daily. Um, there's lots of information, including signage, information for workplaces, information about local cases. So you can check that out. And if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to email me, uh, mferris at peterboroughpublichealth.ca. And again, what I'll do is I'll respond to all the, the questions in a Q&A style document, uh, which will be returned to your workplace. And I 
all of your names, uh, every, anybody that asks questions, uh, your names will be kept confidential. It won't be included on the Q&A document. It won't be sent back to your workplace or anything like that. Um, if you'd prefer to call, um, my extension here is 318. And uh, I guess I should have put this on the slideshow, but uh, the number 705-743-1000, extension 318. Okay, thank you very much.